Today, I'm very proud to be announcing our healthcare and COVID team at a critical time. <clears throat> as we near the end of one of the toughest years we face as a nation, more than 285,000 dead Americans because of COVID-19 and counting. Last week, COVID-19 was the number one cause of death in America. For Black, Latino, and Native Americans, who are nearly three times as likely to die from it, COVID-19 is a mass casualty. For families and friends left behind, it's a gaping hole in your heart that will never be fully healed. As a country, we've been living with this pandemic for so long, we're at risk of becoming numb to its toll on all of us. You know, we're, uh, we're resigned to feel that there's nothing uh, we can do, that we can't trust one another, that we must accept death, pain, and sorrow. We're in the midst of this deadly pandemic that has infected almost 15 million Americans, one out of every 22 people in our country, often with devastating consequences of health. And at this very moment, what is the outgoing administration asking the Supreme Court to do in the United States Supreme Court? To repeal the entirety of the Affordable Care Act when we need it most. A law that's on the front lines against the pandemic, protects more than 100 million Americans who live with pre-existing conditions, which will increase now, including those with lung scarring and heart damage as a consequence of COVID-19. It provides coverage for more than 20 million Americans who get the care they need if they're showing symptoms of COVID-19. The law that fulfills our moral obligation here in America, health care is a right for all, not a privilege for a few. But as all of you know, I know that out of our collective pain, we're going to find a collective purpose to control the pandemic, to save lives, and to heal as a nation. Today, I'm pleased to announce a team that is going to do just that. It's a team of world-class experts at the top of their fields, crisis-tested, defined by a deep sense of duty, honor, and patriotism. They're already ready to jump in. They've been advising me, many of them, for a long time. And they're going to be ready on day one to spare not a single effort to get this pandemic under control so we can get back to work, get back to our lives, get back to our loved ones. They'll lead the COVID-19 response across the government to accelerate testing, fix our supply chain, and distribute the vaccine. They'll work with my economic team because controlling the pandemic, delivering better health care, and reviving the economy go hand in hand. They'll work with my foreign policy and national security teams because we can not only beat the virus here at home, it must be beaten everywhere or it comes back to haunt us again. Today, I'm announcing that in consultation with Dr. Tony Fauci, we developed the first three objectives of the new initiative that I'm asking this team to complete once I'm sworn in in our first 100 days in office. My first 100 days won't end the COVID-19 virus. I can't promise that, but, but we did not get into this mess quickly. We're not going to get out of it quickly. It's going to take some time, but I'm absolutely convinced that in 100 days, we can change the course of the disease and change life in America for the better. First, my first 100 days is going to require, I'm going to ask for a masking plan everyone for the first 100 days of my administration to wear a mask. It will start with my signing an order on day one to require masks where I can under the law, like federal buildings, interstate travel on planes, trains, and buses. I'll also be working with the governors and mayors to do the same in their states and their cities. We're going to require masks wherever possible. But this goes beyond government action. And so, as a new president, I'm going to speak directly to the American people and say what I'm saying now. We need your help. Wear a mask for just 100 days. 
It's the easiest thing you can do to reduce COVID cases, hospitalizations, and death. Help yourself, your family, and your community. Whatever your politics or point of view, mask up for 100 days once we take office. 100 days to make a difference. It's not a political statement. It's a patriotic act. It won't be the end of our efforts, but it's a necessary and easy beginning, an easy start. Secondly, this team, this team will help get at the latest, at the last 100 million COVID-19 vaccine, at least 100 million COVID vaccine shots into the arms of the American people in the first 100 days. 100 million shots in the first 100 days. And we'll follow the guidance of science to get the vaccines to those most at risk. That includes healthcare professionals, people in long-term care, and as soon as possible, it will include educators. This will be the most efficient mass vaccination plan in U.S. history. I credit everyone who has gotten up to we've, has gotten us up to this point. But developing a vaccine is only one Herculean task. Distributing it is another Herculean task. You know, and vaccines in a vial only work if they're injected into an arm of people, especially those most at risk. This will be one of the hardest and most costly operational challenges in our nation's history. We're going to need Congress to fully fund vaccine distribution to all corners of the country, to everyone. I'm encouraged by the bipartisan efforts in Congress around a $900 billion economic relief package, which I've said is critical. But this package is only a start for more action early next year. We must also focus significant resources on direct public health response to COVID-19. Our preliminary view of Trump administration's vaccine distribution plans confirms media reports. Without urgent action by this Congress this month to put sufficient resources into vaccine distribution and manufacturing, which the bipartisan group is working on, there's a real chance that after an early round of vaccinations, the effort will slow and stall. Let me repeat, we need Congress to finish the bipartisan work underway now, where millions of Americans may wait months longer to get the vaccine. Months longer than they otherwise would have to get, wait to get the vaccine, the vaccination. Look, and then we're going to need additional action next year to fund the rest of the distribution efforts. We we'll also need the Trump administration to act now, though, to purchase the doses it has negotiated with Pfizer and Moderna, and to work swiftly to scale manufacturing to U.S. populations and the world. This can be fixed. If it does, if it is fixed, my team will be able to get at least 100 million vaccinations done in my first 100 days. The third thing I'm going to ask in the 100 days, it should be a national priority to get our kids back into school and keep them in school. If Congress provides the funding we need to protect students, educators, and staff, if states and cities put strong public health measures in place that we all follow, then my team will work to see that a majority of our schools can be open by the end of my first 100 days. That's right. We'll look to have the most schools open that we can possibly in 100 days if Congress provides the funding we need. It's not a secret how to do it. Masking, vaccinations, opening schools. These are the three key goals for my first 100 days. But we'll still have much to do in the year ahead, and sadly, much difficulty as well. We'll be far, far from done. Yet, it's possible that after 100 days, we'll be much further along in the fight against this pandemic. And I'm grateful to the members of my COVID team that I'd like to introduce to you now, who will lead the way. I'm really proud of this group. For Secretary of Health and Education Service, I nominated Javier Bacaria. You know, Javier Bashira, excuse me. 
He currently, the Attorney General of California, leading the second largest Justice Department in America, only behind the United States Department of Justice. And for nearly 25 years before that, he was a congressman representing Los Angeles, one of the largest, America's largest and most diverse cities. Javier spent a career fighting to expand access to health care, reducing racial health disparities, protecting the Affordable Care Act, and take on powerful special interests to prey on profit off of people's health, from opioid manufacturers to big tobacco. During this pandemic, he'll protect the safety of the frontline health care workers, rooted out the fraud from the bad actors who take advantage of people. And he stood up for homeowners trying to pay their mortgages during this devastating economic crisis. There are things he's already fought for and accomplished in many cases. And as secretary, HHS secretary, he will skillfully oversee the CDC and the FDA, Medicare and Medicaid. No matter what happens in the Supreme Court, he'll lead our efforts to build on the Affordable Care Act. He'll work to dramatically expand coverage and take bold steps to lower health care and prescription drug costs. Javier is a key leader who lead a, a key agency charged with protecting the health and wellness of the American people. He's also the first Latino leading the HHS, the son of a working family class, working class immigrant family that came from Mexico, a true public servant who's dedicated his career in the service of the people and the service of this country that we all love. To serve as coordinator, of the COVID-19 response team, I'm turning a world-class manager and leader. I've known Jeff for a long time, from the first and last days of the Obama-Biden White House and throughout the campaign and now the transition. There's no one else you'd want to help manage some of the most consequential and complex priorities of a country. Director of National Economic Council for President Obama, acting director for the Office of Management and Budget, He's there, was there during the Great Recession as he went from crisis to recovery to resurgence in eight years. He was there to lead the team and help implement the Affordable Care Act and get healthcare.gov up and working at a critical moment. That was a monumental feat that required vision, patience, experience, fortitude, and real expertise. Well respected across the aisle, and around the country, from business to labor leaders to entrepreneurs to educators. Chairman of the board of the Children's National Medical Center, one of the world's top children's hospitals, Jeff knows how to build and lead a team, how to identify and solve problems, and how to fully mobilize the federal government on behalf of the health, safety, and prosperity of the American people. Jeff Zients, thank you for being willing to do this again. The Surgeon General of the United States, I nominate a man who could do any of these jobs, I think, but Dr. Vivek Murthy. He worked with me for a long time. He's a renowned physician and research scientist, a trusted national leader on health care, and for me, a trusted advisor during the campaign and transition. This will be the second time serving as America's doctor, having served in this role under President Obama. <laughs> During his tenure, he took on some of the most pressing public health issues we face. <laughs> Excuse me. From the opioid crisis to threats to America's mental health, I've asked Dr. Murthy to serve again as Surgeon General, but with expanded responsibilities. He will be a key public voice on the COVID response to restore public trust and faith in science and medicine. One of the reasons, Doc, I ask you to do this, when you speak, people listen. They trust you. You have a way of communicating. They can just see it in your eyes. I mean it sincerely. It's a really, really important thing to be communicated now when people are in so much doubt. But it'll also be a key advisor to me and help lead all government approach to broader public health issues. We've talked a lot about the need to vastly increase the focus on mental health in the country addiction and substance use disorders, social and environmental detriments to health, and much more. So I'm really looking forward, and thank you for doing this. Above all, I believe 
I believe, as well as any person I've ever worked with, Vivek can help restore faith in this country as a place of possibilities. The son of Indian immigrants who raised their children always believe in the promise of America. Dr. Murthy will be one of my most trusted public health and medical advisors, and I'm grateful, and I mean it sincerely, Vivek, I'm grateful for your willingness to continue to stay in public service. And for Director of the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, and prevention, I might add, I appoint Rochelle Walensky. She's a chief infectious disease, she's chief of infectious disease at one of the country's most preeminent hospitals, Massachusetts General in Boston, a distinguished professor at Harvard Medical School and a world-class physician, one of the nation's foremost experts on testing, treatment, and eradication of viruses. She has served on the, on the front lines on the COVID crisis. She's conducted groundbreaking research on vaccine delivery, including how to reach underserved communities that are too often hit first hardest and treat it last. Dr. Olinsky's work was instrumental in helping the world mitigate the public health crisis of HIV AIDS. It inspired her as a young doctor to pursue her pioneering research in virus containment. Now, she will bring her expertise to bear against COVID-19. She's uniquely qualified to restore morale and public trust. She'll marshal our finest scientists and public health experts at CDC to turn the tide on this urgent crisis we're facing today. Because of the pandemic's disproportionate impact on communities of color, I concluded that I wanted, we needed, a COVID-19 equity task force. To chair that, to chair it, I appoint Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, one of the country's foremost experts on health care disparities, associate professor of medicine and public health and management at Yale School of Medicine, founding director of Yale's Equity Research and Innovation Center, and co-chair of my COVID-19 Transition Advisory Board. Dr. Nunez-Smith will lead our efforts to provide care to the communities most in need and most affected by the pandemic and often overlooked. She'll ensure that fairness and equity are at the center of every part of our response. This is a central front in our fight against this pandemic, and I'm grateful Dr. Nunez-Smith will lead this charge. And finally, as both head of my National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and my chief medical advisor on COVID-19, I'm pleased to say that Dr. Tony Fauci will be a member of my COVID team. By now, Tony needs, Dr. Fauci needs no introduction, but he'll have my gratitude when I'm president, the seventh president he will have served. We know each other, and we've known each other for a long time, and I'm so grateful when I called him almost before I asked, he said yes. I've seen him take on HIV AIDS, H1N1, Ebola, Zika, COVID-19, and every infectious disease in between over his nearly 40 years of service to our country. Dr. Fauci is trusted, a truth teller, a patriot. Like every good doctor, he'll tell me what I need to know, not what I want to know, what I need to know, not what I want to know. This is my core COVID health care team. Before January 20th, we'll be adding more leaders to oversee vaccine distribution, the supply chain, testing, and other key functions. To each of you on this team, you have my gratitude, and I mean that. You have my gratitude for answering the call to serve. And to your families, I know many of you are making real sacrifices to do this. Thank you. And to your families, I say thank you directly. We couldn't do this without them or without you, the families, supporting this. And to the American people, I know we've all had a lot of sleepless nights this year. So many of you staring at the ceiling tonight, worrying, my God, what happens? What happens if it strikes my family? What happens if I lose my insurance? What happens? Am I going to be okay? Is my family going to be okay? All I can tell you is the truth. 
We're in a very dark winter. Things may well get worse before they get better. A vaccine may soon be available. We need to level with one another. It'll take longer than we would like to distribute it to all corners of the country, depending on how it gets started off between now and the time I'm sworn in. We'll need to persuade enough Americans to take the vaccine. Many of them have become very cynical about its usefulness. It's daunting. But I promise you that we'll make progress starting on day one. But we didn't get into this mess quickly. It's going to take time to fix. But we can do this. That's the truth. And telling you the truth is what this team, Vice President-elect Harris and I, will always do. Give it to you straight from the shoulder, as Roosevelt used to say. This is the toughest challenge America has ever faced one of the toughest. But we know that we can overcome and heal together as one nation. To all of you on the front lines, the healthcare professionals, first responders, grocery store workers, delivery truck drivers, educators, parents, our children, I say thank you. But we can do this. We can do this. I want to thank you for everything you've done to get us through this crisis so far. We're never going to give up on you, I promise you. And we'll never give up on our country. We can do this. There's nothing we've ever failed to do when we've decided to do it together. Together. That's America. To all those who have lost in this pandemic, all those who are sick and suffering, our hearts go out to you. Many of us know what it's like. May God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you for listening. 